You know that song, Alabaster Jar? And it, the, ver the bridge at the end of it, it goes, uh, Worthy, worthy, you are worthy. And I was singing that to the Lord. And I was singing it, strumming my guitar, and all of a sudden I felt like the Lord spoke to me. He says, I don't hear that enough. I don't hear that enough. Most of the time, a lot of times he deals with babies. People who kick and scream and, and tell him foolish things like, God, I don't love you. And I hate you. You're not my dad. You know, we do that in the spirit all the time. But not often do we look at the Father and we just say, you're worthy. All this suffering, all this trial, all this tribulation, all this hardship. God, whatever you call me to do, you're worth it. You're worth every second. God, and if I could do it again, I wouldn't change a thing. Because you're worth it. I just felt that, man. Like, we live our lives. We might say these things and we profess these things with our mouth. But in our hearts, we don't live lives that, that really say that, God, I trust you and you're good. When he puts something in our life or when he leads us in a direction, nine out of ten times we don't want to go. And we complain and we whine. And we say, God, why? And what about this? And in our hearts, we're looking over here when God is calling us this way. And in our eyes, in our hearts, in our desires, in our focus is over here. And God is saying that if you would just let go, if you would just trust me, if you would just look to me, you would find that my way is for your best interest. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to unfulfill you. In fact, he wants to do the opposite. He wants us satisfied. He wants us fulfilled. He wants us full of hope and full of joy. He wants us full of peace. He wants every good thing that we ourselves as human beings crave for. We crave all these things, and, and, and every single one of these things is fulfilled in our relationship with God. That's it. And if we would just let go and trust him, we would find not once in my life when I find when I let go and I said, God, okay, I'll do. Never once did I look back and go, man, I would have wish, I wish I would have went the other way. Not once. Every single time I look back and I say, God, this is wonderful. Why in the world didn't I do this sooner? And you know, as you grow and you and you learn and you mature, you, you don't have to go through the process of what you did when you were immature, of fighting and kicking and screaming. You finally learned to let go and to trust and to just say, God, okay, I trust you. I trust you and I'm not going to whine and I'm not going to complain. In fact, I'm going to be grateful for what I know is on the other side of this. I know what the end of this story is. And I don't need to get there to experience what I know is coming. I can live that now. And we can do that. I can live heaven now in my heart because of what Christ has done for us. And that's kind of what this sermon was about. So often we have our we have our eyes and we have our minds and we have our hearts on, on, on other things and looking at the things of this world. And we need to stop. We need to get our eyes back on Christ. We need to get our hearts back on Christ because he's it. If you read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11, you don't have to go here. I don't know if I'm going to go to Scripture tonight. It's supposed to be short. Anyway, right? You go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11, I believe. It might be around there because if you don't find it, just jump around. It's in chapter 3, I promise you. And it says this. It says, but God accomplished his eternal purpose in Christ. God accomplished his eternal purpose in Christ. From the beginning to the end, God always wanted, always desired, always had in mind Christ Jesus. He never strayed away from that. He never turned from the left or to the right. He always intended Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus was not God's plan B. We did not mess up his plan A. And so God all of a sudden had to come to plan B and then send Christ to redeem something that we screwed up. God did not do that. Christ was always his plan A. 
And it says that in Ephesians that God accomplished his eternal purpose in Christ. And so everything that you see, everything that you experience, everything that you've heard, everything that you've gone through, if in some form or fashion it has to do at the core with Christ, why do I look to other things? Why do I look to other people? Why do I pursue other things? It's about Christ Jesus. It always was, it always is, and it always will be. I remember a time I was sitting in church, and this was when I was straying. After I learned about God's love, I strayed from it. And I remember this one time I was sitting in this church, Mars Hill, Rob Bell's pastor. He was preaching this sermon about Revelations, and it was Revelations chapter 4 about the throne of God. And he had this crystal clear, he had this throne that was clear. I don't know what it plexiglass, whatever it was made out of. And he had it sitting on this stage. And I remember at the end of this church service that I was sitting in my chair and the presence of God just came over me. And I just, I'm terrified. I'm weeping and I'm terrified because I know how much this God loves me. I know how powerful he is that he's nothing to mess with. He's nothing to, to toy with and treat flippantly. He's powerful. He's terrified. And his desire in his heart, it says in scripture, that he's jealous for me. He's jealous for me. And when his presence came over me, I remember looking at this throne and all I could hear in my heart is I'm, I'm shaking and my mom's got her arm around me and I'm weeping and I'm, and I'm hearing the Lord say to me, it's all about me. It always was. It always is. And it always will be. It's all about me. It always was, it always is, and it always will be. And I remember trembling under that presence as he just spoke that to me. It's always about God. It's always intended to be about Jesus. That's what God wanted to. He delights in Christ Jesus. And he delights in us because we're the image of Christ. And Paul says something in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he's reminding these Corinthians about the gospel. And he's trying to get them back to the gospel. And he says to them, he says, look, the gospel, listen, he, he first says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach to you. Which he says, I'm repeating to you the gospel. I'm telling you guys again, you heard it and you accepted it once, but now I'm trying to remind you because you guys, we need a reminder about the gospel. We get caught up in left, right, or other things. But if we get to the core of the gospel and we get to the simple truths of the good, wonderful, God-given, divine gospel, radically change your life. These apostles knew that you didn't need all this other stuff. They knew that. And that's why they were in unison about one thing. And they said that we preach Christ and we preach Christ crucified and resurrected that we might have life. And we need to get back to that core about Jesus Christ crucified and his resurrection for me. And one reason I love this in John, 1 John chapter 4, it says the reason that Christ was crucified for us, it says that God displayed his love for us. He didn't just sit in heaven and talk about it. He put it into action. God could have sat in heaven and said, I love you, I love you, and I love you, and it would have been true. It would have been 100% true. I love you. And I would have been like, wow. But what Christ Jesus does is I now, I don't have to just listen to it. I can look, and I can see, and I can say, wow, you love me. You don't just love me. You love me. You crucified your son for me. You love me. And I don't just have to listen to the words, even though that helps, but I can always look at this picture and I can go, oh my gosh. What? Little me. You love me and you died for me. And what it's honestly supposed to do is when you honestly get to that core gospel that Christ literally, he gave his life for us. 
Paul says this, it's the love of Christ that compels us. That I no longer live, but I live for the one who died for me. And we need to get back to that reality too. And we get it by looking at the cross. We look at Jesus. We look at his face. And we get back to the reality. It's not about your life. It's not about your goals. It's not about your dreams. It's not about those things. It's about the one who gave everything for you. And if I have this, the privilege, think about this. We're talking about the king of glory. If I have the privilege that I could come to and offer, everything that I have would still not be remotely close or even touching the value and the worth of what he is and the majesty of what he is. And if I have the privilege to come to him and to sing that love and say, God, since you love me so much, I'll give you my miserable life. If I have that privilege, Motive me if I ever think otherwise. It's insane. My life should be an offering, and if that means that God takes my baby, so be it. My life is His, and He can do with it what He wants. And that's a privilege. It's a privilege, and the, the, the apostles saw that. They would get beaten for Christ, they would lay stripes on their backs. And would you think they would whine and say, God, why is this happening to me? They would get stripes on their back and they would walk away praising and jumping and leaping and saying, oh, that I was worthy to suffer for the name of Christ Jesus. And if God saw me and my wife worthy, then amen. I'm happy and I'm glad that my father is smiling. And that I was worthy and I pray that in that suffering that his name was glorified. The other thing, 1 Corinthians 15, is this what it says. Verse 10, I believe. It's my favorite verse. And Paul says when he looks at the crucifixion and what Christ did in his resurrection that we might have life, he says this. He says, but by the grace of God I am what I am. His grace to me was not without effect, though I labored harder than all of them. But Paul had a revelation in that understanding. He said, yeah, it wasn't even me laboring, but it was the grace of God that was in me. When Paul got back to the core of the gospel, something else that he remembered is he says, I am what I am. I'm where I am. How many people made yourself? How many people in here gave themselves life? Life. How many people give themselves breath in the morning? How many people wake themselves up? Where was I before I was born? Let me ask you that. Where were you before you were born? And I thank God every day that he gave me the privilege to participate in this life. I was nowhere. And it's not that life didn't exist. Life happened for the last 6,000 whatever years. We're about to find out tomorrow. But life happened. You just weren't part of it. You were absent from it. He chose you that this was happening. And I was just, I didn't exist. I was nothingness. Not even a thought, not even a dream. My parents didn't even think about me for one second. And then God said in a perfect time, he said, now. And you know what in Acts at chapter 17, what it says is that the purpose that God did that, he puts you exactly where you are in his hope. Do you know what his hope was? That you would somehow just reach out and grope around and look for him and seek for him. And what you would find out is he's not very far. He's not very far. And what it does when we look at that grace and we look at that love and we look at it, it says, Paul, but by the grace of God, my life, well, I, didn't, I don't sustain my life. I don't give myself life. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I didn't give myself my talents. I didn't give myself my looks. I didn't give myself any of that stuff. It's all been given to me. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you've received it, why do you boast as though you do not? I should never boast in myself. I should never boast in anything that I've ever done, ever. 
And Paul realized that there's one thing that we boast in, and that's Christ Jesus. He said, I didn't receive anything. God made me. And but by the grace of God, he made me what I am, and I'm okay with it. And in fact, I love it because he gave me an opportunity to participate in life with him. More than that is to experience him in this age. To experience him. You're going to experience something nobody else will. And Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am. But his grace to me was not without effect. He says it wasn't in vain. God's hope was that when he gave us life, and that his hope was that we would reach out and that we would find him. That we would seek after him and that we would enjoy him, that we would experience him and find a relationship and love for him. Was the grace of God in vain? Because if you're not that reality, if you're not participating with Christ, well, you're almost sometimes better off not. You're probably better off not existing. Because the end result is not going to be any good. He says, I am what I am. But it wasn't in vain. He says, what was the product when he saw, when he saw God's love for him, when he saw what God gave him, when he saw everything that God poured out to him? What was, what was, his, what was his heart? I love this verse. He says, I worked harder than all of them. He was sold out. He gave everything. Didn't look back. Not flinching. Not thinking, oh, what about this? Or maybe I'll go over here. Or, or maybe I'll do this. Or maybe that. He said, God, your purpose and your purpose only. I see you, Jesus. And I see what you've done for me. And I see the door you've opened up for me. And it's you, you, and you alone. Nothing else. I don't care where you send me. I don't care what I say. I don't care how long I sit in prison. I don't care how long I got to be there. I don't care how long I got to be in Teen Challenge. So that one comes. Whatever you want, God, I'll labor for you, and I'll work. And if I pour my life out like a drink offering, waste it. In my point of view, waste it. Then every second will still be worth it, because he's worth it. And we got to get back to that. And I'll tell you what, guys. Revelation Christ Jesus crucified. Actually, let's go there, actually. Go to Matthew, chapter 16. to them, but whom say ye that I am? Christ was asking his disciples. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. For I say also unto thee that Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Listen to this. And the gates of hell will not prevail. What's he talking about? Is he talking about Catholic Church? And he says, upon this rock, the Catholic Church, Peter, you're the rock that I'm going to build the church. You're going to be the first pope. Is that what Jesus was talking about? Absolutely not. What Jesus did is he challenged them. He was asking you know what's crazy is I had this happen about a year and a half ago. I didn't really realize this was happening, but I felt like it was Jesus standing in front of me. And he was like, Eric, who do you say that I am? Do you believe that I'm the Son of God? And here's a side note. One reason that we, we know that Christ was, in fact, the Son of the living God. Does anybody know Romans chapter 1? His resurrection. It says he was declared to be the Son of God through the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead was evidence to me that he was in fact who he claimed to be when he lived on this earth. I love that saying, uh, who does C.S. Lewis? 
He says this. You have your, I've read a bunch of secular books lately. Not a bunch. Maybe like three. But I've noticed that sometimes they refer to Jesus as being a great teacher and they often quote a lot of his sayings. But that's so silly to me. Because I love C.S. Lewis said that he said Jesus can't be a good teacher. All those, all those religions that think he's a prophet and a good teacher can't happen. Doesn't make sense. Either Jesus, and he says the three L's. He was a liar. You got to remember he walked around talking to be the son of God. And so either he was an extreme liar and didn't know what he was talking about. That's one option. And then I'll tell you what, if you got a habitual liar, somebody who can't tell the truth really, would you call them a good teacher? Probably not. Discredited. Unworthy. You wouldn't, you wouldn't put it up to them. And the second option is as a lunatic. Or he was crazy and he did think that he was the son of God. And the last one is in the Lord. A liar or a lunatic, you wouldn't think that he's a good teacher. So he can't be a good teacher. He's either a liar, he's either a lunatic, or he is, in fact, the Lord. And one thing as Christians, we can rest easy because he showed me by his resurrection. That put a seal on all his claims was when he overcame death in the grave. And he did. Showed himself to multitudes. Resurrected life. Who do you say that I am? And when Peter's, when he's asking Peter, what he's saying is he's saying, you know what I'm going to build my church on? He's saying the revelation of the Christ. Peter answered and said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, upon that revelation, that's what I'm going to build my church. And what does he say right after that? And he says, and the gates of hell will not prevail. It says that if you know that you know that you know that Christ is in fact the Son of the living God and He was who He claimed to be, that you can't turn away, that you can't quit. I, don't, I can't believe that when I talk to unbelievers and they say, I believe in God. But that they live as heathens or they live for their jobs and they live for their monies and they live for their families or their girlfriends. I can't, I can't believe that. And I was one of them at one time, totally deceived, because I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in God. That's not true. You believe in God, but it doesn't, we're talking about God. And it doesn't drastically change your everyday life. Drastically. That's insane. If you truly believe that God exists and you don't drastically change the way that you think, the way that you feel, the way that you act, the way that you, all of that stuff. And then on top of that, you really believe that Jesus is the son of the living God, the incarnate Christ, God, man, made flesh, and you don't give your life to follow him? You don't understand who he is. You might say who he is, but you don't know who he is. That thought should drastically change our lives, and that's what he's talking about when he says, I'm going to build my church. Not on doing stuff, but people who are sold out to understanding that he was, in fact, the Christ who, was, who died, was buried, and raised for us. Because when you have that revelation, it produces in you a sold outness that you're never going to give up. You're never quitting. In John chapter 6, Peter has that. Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, Are you guys going to leave too? Are you going to quit? Are you going to give up? Are you going to go back to doing your own life? Are you going to be doing that things? And Peter looks at him and he goes, "What? Well, where am I? Where am I going to go? That's insane. How could I do that? You have the words of eternal life. It's because Peter had that same revelation and put in him, I can't quit. Even if I wanted to go somewhere else, work somewhere else, Deuce, I can't. I can't. I know what God has showed me. I remember that once I was struggling. And I remember laying in my bed at night crying. And I remember going, God, you can send me to hell at the end of my life. But I can't quit. I can't quit. And I remember telling him that if you choose to do that, I trust you. If that's what he gives me, if that's what I deserve, then I trust him. He's faithful and he's just. But I can't stop preaching the gospel. I can't stop pursuing the Lord. I can't stop loving Jesus. I can't stop. 
I can't stop. And we need that. We need that back in the church, but we need to get our eyes off the stuff. We need to get our eyes back on Jesus. Because all your questions will be answered in Him. Everything that you seek after, everything that you desire will be found in Him. He is the eternal purpose that God accomplished. It's done. And it's found in Him. We need to get back to Him and seeking after Him and understanding Him. It's all found there. The devil distracts us. 